Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome again to White Flag. We're so glad to have you all here today. Before we jump into the message, I just wanted to share a quick update with you all to, to tell you that uh, this past week I had the opportunity to, to go to a conference, the Next Level Conference at Compassion Christian Church with our pastors and our elders. And I just wanted to tell you that we had a great time. It was uh, a time full of, of encouragement and uh, a lot of great ideas about how we can continue to lead White Flag forward in this next season of ministry. And I just wanted to share a couple of observations that, that we all sort of had while we were there and together and and you know one of them was just how thankful we are for white flag for all of you you know first of all <clears throat> Excuse me. First of all, we're, we were able to go to this conference because of your faithful giving. The fact that you give each and every week and you tithe and you give generously as a part of our white flag strong DNA, it allows us to, to be able to take advantage of key opportunities like, like this. To be able to go to a conference like the Next Level Conference where we were able to interact with, with pastors and leaders from churches all over the country, even some, even some from other countries across the world. And, and so we just wanted to extend a, a special thank you to you for affording us that opportunity. The other thing that, that we noticed was, um, you know, we're, we were continually grateful for the, the folks who serve on a weekly basis here at White Flag. You know, this was a conference put on at a church by a church. It's a, a church that's larger than ours, but uh, everybody who was there was, was serving. They were volunteers, people who took off of work to be there, people um, who, were, who were helping out and chipping in in their normal weekend service roles. They were doing it in the middle of the week for this conference. And, and I just couldn't help but think, you know, if we did that at White Flag, our folks would show up like they always do. We would have our folks greeting at the door like they were. We would have our folks working in the tech like we do. And, uh, and it was just kind of another moment of encouragement that I wanted to say thank you for the ways that you serve here at White Flag each and every week. And then finally, it was a special time of community. We were able to connect with other pastors and leaders, like I mentioned, uh, and, and worship together and learn together and, and share stories together and share ideas together. And I just couldn't help but, but, but think about how important it is to do this thing called a walk with the Lord in community. You know, our mission here is to transform lives by connecting people with Jesus' word and community. And I think sometimes we, we sell short that last one, that third one, and the importance that community is. And so, um, you know, I just want to say thank you for those of you who are all in to this white flag community because I promise you, you're having an impact on somebody else even if you don't know it. That, that interaction that you have in the lobby on a Sunday morning or in your small group throughout the week or, or on your serving team, that interaction is having an impact on folks. You, you don't even realize the way that people leave interacting with you encouraged because of that community because that's what we did. We left some time with other leaders, other pastors, other folks who are uh, walking with the Lord and want to give their very best to the Lord each and every week. We left encouraged because of that community. So uh, I'll, I'll take this as an opportunity for another shameless plug that if you're new here, we want you to get connected with us because that community is part of the transformation that, that God promises us in his word. And so if you haven't done that, I'll, I'll remind you of Christy's announcement already, but, but take, it, take a moment after service to go to Guest Central in the lobby afterwards. Uh, it's not because we're just wanting your phone number so that we can hound you afterwards. It's because we want to invite you into the transformation, the life transformation that can happen by connecting with Jesus, his word, and his community. Well, between that conference and uh, a snow day, which, by the way, we were like one of only a half dozen flights that did not get canceled on Thursday. We have no idea how it happened. We were sitting in the airport in Atlanta Thursday morning just saying, any minute they're going to tell us that our day has just changed drastically, and yet we, we got there. And then JoLynn House drove her car to pick us up in the middle of the snow. It was, um, well, scary, but awesome. And so we were glad to be home. Um, but anyway, so I, I don't know how that happened. So if you were praying for us to get home safely, thank you, because it worked. Um, but between, between the conference and then snow canceling our services on Thursday, we decided to just press pause on the Family is Everything series. Um, we didn't want to wrap it up in a weird weekend like that. Uh, and so we're going we're gonna to continue on that series next week. But this week, uh, Pastor Jason is here. Uh, Paul's actually a little bit under the weather. You know, the other fun of traveling this time of year is... You might end up not feeling great, so um, you can be praying for him to, to get well soon. But uh, we've got Pastor Jason. He's going to preach a, a, a message called Salt and Light. Uh, and, you know, I was thinking about it. 
as we would have a speaker at, come up to the stage, um, they were generally greeted very wildly and excitedly because folks were happy to hear the message that they were about to deliver. And when we are blessed the way we are with such effective, strong communicators each and every week, I think we can sometimes take that for granted. And so I would like to ask you, instead of a bumper video like we normally do, can you guys be the bumper video? And we'll just say, Pastor Jason, come on out, and why don't you act like you're excited that he's going to preach the word of the Lord today? Right? Can we do that? Give it up for Jason. Come on out, Jason. Well, thank you for that. Thank you, Brian. Well, thank you guys for braving the snow and the cold this morning and being here with us. And if you're at home because you couldn't make it out, thanks for joining us online as well this morning. But as Brian said, we're going to take a pause this week. We're not going to talk about family as everything. And instead, we're going to talk about the life that Jesus wants you to live. Because whether you know this or not, the gospel is a continuous story and a continuous amount of sayings from Jesus to help us live the life that Jesus is calling us to. And in particular, in the very first passage, or the very first message that Jesus teaches in his public ministry, he actually lays out what does it look like to live that kind of life. And there's a series of sayings that he says in this. Many of you know it. It's called the Beatitudes, where he says, blessed are the meek, blessed are the peacemakers, all these kinds of sayings that lay out what it looks like to be a follower of of Jesus. And yet, even as he's saying these things, you and I, we hear these, and I bet we have the same kind of reaction that his disciples likely had as Jesus laid this out. We're probably thinking, Jesus, those are not qualities that seem like things like the world values. I mean, our world does not value humbleness and meekness or peacemakers. We want people that get things done. We want people that are aggressive in the way that they handle things. They, those are the people that affect change in this world. And yet this is what Jesus calls his followers to be, to be meek and humble. And he turns to his disciples, and, and I'm, like I said, I'm guessing the disciples thought, Jesus, I don't know what you're talking about, but we thought you were coming to, to make a change in this world. But you're talking about gentleness and meekness, and if you've ever worked with people that are gentle and humble, those are the people usually in the business world that get chewed up, and spit out, get stepped on, and walked all over. But Jesus is calling us to live that kind of life, that beatitude kind of life. And after he lays all these out, then he turns to his disciples and he says this in Matthew chapter 5, starting in verse 13. He says, you are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on a stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. And in the same way, let your light shine before others, that, you may, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. So after Jesus lays out what life with him looks like, he turns to his disciples and basically tells them, whether you know this or not, you have influence on the people around you. Now, you can pretend that you don't. You could act like you don't have any influence on the people around you, like what you say and do doesn't matter. But the reality is every person, what they do and what they say in their life impacts the people closest to them. Yes, sometimes their impact is greater than other times, but everyone, if they have an impact on their kids, their coworkers, their friends, their family, students, kids, whether you know this or not, you have influence on your families. You have influence on your parents. And if you don't believe me, just trust me, there is no parent in the world that hasn't experienced a moment in their life when they're driving down the road And they're singing along to one of their kids' songs. Like the little kid songs, you know, like the wheels on the bus type songs. You find yourself singing along to that or they're maybe whatever they're listening to on the radio. Like this is terrible, but you find yourself singing along to it. I mean, for me, I have a son that's involved in theater. And I remember this day, I'm driving down the road. 
and I'm suddenly find myself singing along to show tunes in the car. And I thought, what has happened to me? How did I get to this point? All that to say, you have influence on the people around you, whether or not you want to admit it or not. And no matter how hard you may try to hide from it or run from it, or how you don't want to show it to the people around you, the truth is, you're influenced by others, and you influence them as well. The poet John Donne says that no man is an island. Think about that. You cannot isolate yourself to the point that you aren't influenced by the world and that you are not influencing the world. And Jesus tells his disciples, you are and you will be, and everyone who follows me will be my representatives to this world. The way that you live, the way that you act, the way that you carry yourselves, the things that you say, the things that you do, they will tell the world who I am. In fact, in one of Jesus' final prayers in John 17, he says this. He says, my prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but you protect them from the evil one. They are not of this world, even as if I'm not from this world. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. And this is really important right here. As you sent me into the world, as God sent Jesus into the, the world to change it, Jesus says, I have sent them into the world. If you call yourself a follower of Jesus, the truth is you are the representative of God in this world, in your lives. The way that you influence people is a representation to them of who God is. So the question you have to ask yourself is what kind of influence are you having on the people in your lives? Now, Jesus isn't really giving us an option whether or not we will influence people. This is pretty much a command that we are going to influence people. He's commanding his disciples to live this beatitude, this characteristic life of being different, being countercultural to the world. To not live in isolation, but instead live in such a way that you're changing the world around you. And everything in this passage about salt and light hinges on a biblical worldview that we all need to agree on today. And that's this. The world that we live in, the world that we take part in every day is a world that is corrupted, that is decaying, that lives in darkness. Jesus knew it was true in his day. He knew it would be true 50 years later, 100 years later, and 2,000 years later that the world would be living in darkness and corruption. And no matter how many advances we make in this life, it's not going to change. Look at what it says in 2 Timothy 3.12. It says, in fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. If you want to live that beatitude kind of life, then you're going to be persecuted for it. And he continues, he says, while evildoers and apostles will go from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. No matter how hard we try, no matter how many advances we make in technology or any other thing in our life, this world is not getting better morally. It won't. The whole world isn't growing more Christ-like. I love how John MacArthur says this. He says that the decay that is in this world has just simply found more ways to express and promote itself. We can now broadcast our decay to everyone around us. And this couldn't be more true. Think about it. If, if you pull up social media of any kind, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, doesn't matter. You pull it up, you can look at it, and you can see this world in decay. You can see what this society has become. It's not getting better. It gets worse every single day. This world is dark. And it's corrupted. Now, I'm not saying that there isn't good in the world. There absolutely is. But no matter how much you want to admit it, don't want to admit it, we are touched and affected by the corruption of the world, by the decay of this world. Even worse, we don't want to admit it, but sometimes we play a part in the decay of the world. But Jesus is saying, listen, life was never intended, and it doesn't have to be this way. Instead of being part of the issue, we can be an agent of change in this world. And so Jesus teaches us these things, and he turns to his followers, and then says this thing about salt and light. And he uses 
these two items, salt and light, to express how we're supposed to live. And why does he do this? Why these two things? The most important thing is they were common to everyone. It didn't matter how much money you had, how rich, how poor, anything in between. Everyone needed salt and everyone needed light. And as the people heard him speak, they all would have understood the purpose for salt and light in their world. Every house needs both of those things. So let's take a moment and talk about salt. Let's talk about what salt means or what it meant for the people that heard this in Jesus' time. Now, I, I want you to take a quick notice that Jesus doesn't say you can be or you might be salt. He says you will be, you are the salt of the earth. If you're his follower, you are the salt of the earth. The only question is, will you be good salt? Or you will, be, will you be salt that has lost its saltiness? But what's so important about salt? I mean, isn't it just something that's a couple bucks at the store? I mean, I know over the last couple of years, we've gone from just the generic Morton's type salt to pink salts, kosher salt. I mean, all these different things. But none of them are overly expensive. There's something that's common for every single one of us. But you need to understand that in Jesus' day, salt was not common to everyone. Salt was extremely valuable. In fact, one author that I read said that more wars have been fought over salt and salt mines than over money and gold. Now, I couldn't find anything to back that up, but when you think about the uses that salt had, this is something that would have been pretty believable. In fact, the Romans held that outside of sunshine, light, salt was the most valuable thing that someone could possess. And in fact, many of you might already know this, it was so valuable that Roman armies would often pay their soldiers in salt and not coin. That's where we get the saying, he's not worth his salt, basically because he's not worth the wages that he was paid, and he was paid in salt. Salt was a way of sealing treaties. It was a way of holding on to friendships. It was something that even in the Old Testament, God said was important. In Leviticus 2.13, it says this, season all your grain offerings with salt. Do not leave the salt of the covenant of your God out of the grain offerings. Add salt to all your offerings. No matter how you look at this, the truth is to the people listening in Jesus' time, they would have understood that salt was something that was necessary for life and it was extremely valuable, not something to be taken for granted. So why is salt so important? I want you to think about this for just a moment. How many of you have ever gotten just a little small, like, paper cut, and then reached into a bag of chips, and that salt hits that wound? I mean, your first reaction is to jump back, right? I mean, you almost want to scream, ah, oh, man, that really hurts. Or maybe you get a cut someplace, and you're sweating, and the sweat gets into that cut. I mean, it burns, and it stings. We instantly want that salt out of the wound. But why does salt burn a wound? I mean, we have a saying. It's like rubbing salt in the wound, right? When somebody's down or they're hurt, you just add insult to injury. It's like rubbing salt into a wound. Why does it hurt? Well, dating back to even ancient times, salt was important when it came to treating wounds. People would, and in some parts of the world, they still do use salt to treat wounds. Because salt draws out the moisture and the infection out of a wound. It may burn, it may hurt, but while it's doing that, it is healing the wound. Even though it's, just, it's uncomfortable for us and it hurts, salt is something that heals. Now, you may want to speak like a sailor for a few minutes after it gets in the wound, right? But the truth is, that burn and that pain is actually helping you, even as it's hurting you. And likewise, as followers of Christ, sometimes we are called to speak truth into certain situations when people don't want to hear it. Sometimes we are called to speak truth into people's lives when they are off course, when they're living a life however they want to live it. And sometimes we have to speak truth in that situation and people aren't going to want to hear it. This world is a world that says you can do whatever you want, whenever you want, however you want, and it doesn't matter. But the problem is, the more people try to live however they want, the more they realize there is something hurting inside of them, there's something missing inside of them, 
And then they look at you, maybe who's living that beatitude kind of life, that life that Jesus called you to, and they think, man, I, I want that. I want that kind of contentment, that kind of fulfillment. And yet, the moment they realize that in order to live that kind of life, things are going to have to change. It's like pouring salt in an open wound. I would go out on a limb and say that people don't like when we have to speak truth in their life. It hurts them. They're going to initially want to get away from the pain that the salt is causing them or the truth is causing them the discomfort and the burn that it's causing them. So salt is something that actually helps heal wounds and helps get out infection from people. But salt isn't just good for getting out infection. It's not just good for treating wounds. Salt has other purposes as well. Now, several years ago, I was on a trip to, to Lima, Peru, and you might have a similar experience if you've been to Ecuador or the DR but one of the things I noticed quickly going into people's houses and into the church was that there was this appliance that was, a miss, was missing in every house and every church. There were no refrigerators anywhere. There was not one the entire time I was there. And I quickly realized that for these people, when they wanted to have chicken or they wanted to have any kind of meat, they had to go to the market each day to pick it up. And it wasn't like it was a market like, you know, going to Schnucks or Deerberg's. It was literally a chicken hanging in an open-air market. And the only way that they could preserve that chicken from spoiling was to put salt on it. They kept the chicken from spoiling or chicken from going bad. And this is something maybe you've experienced if you've gone to other countries, that when there is no refrigeration or no way to preserve food that way, salt is what is used in order to keep decay from happening. People have used salt to prepare things and preserve things for thousands of years. And as followers of Jesus, and we're being called to live a life that helps prevent the continued decay of this world. We're called to live such a life that keeps our friends and our family members from continuing to go down this path. But then Jesus says something right after. He says, you were the salt of the earth. He says, this saying, which quite honestly never made any sense to me as a kid. He says, but if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? And I always thought, what are you talking about, salt losing its saltiness? I mean, seriously. I mean, I've, we've had salt that we bought, like, for kids' projects when they were, like, in fifth or sixth grade. And it's, like, ten years later, and we still have all that salt. And it's still salty. I mean, how does salt lose it's saltiness. It doesn't go bad. I mean, they can get damp and they can clump up. That's why you put rice in those shakers at a restaurant, right, to keep it from having all that humidity in it. But even that, salt isn't bad. It's still saltiness. But you need to understand that the salt that we use today, it undergoes this incredible refinement process. It gets out all of the impurities so that it is nothing but pure salt. And in Jesus' day, that was not the case. That was not the case. Oftentimes, the salt that they used, they would find it in rocks, and they would grind up rocks that way. But most commonly, they would go to the Dead Sea, and they would just harvest basically the salt, the leftover sea salt. But the problem with that is that both of those types of salt were full of impurities. They were full of things that could cause the saltiness to go away. And when that happened, it became nothing but more, more than white powder that was good for nothing. And likewise, Jesus is trying to tell his disciples, listen, I just gave you all of these things that mark the Christian life, about what it looks like to live a life for me. Talking about being meek and a peacemaker and humble and mercy and all of those things. And when you don't focus on those things and you don't hold to those teachings, impurity gets into your life as well. And when impurity gets into your life, you lose the ability to have salt, be salty as well. You become salt that is full of nothing but impurities and not good for the mission that Jesus is calling you to. You, don't look up, you end up not looking any different than the world around you. And when that happens, you've lost your saltiness. You've lost your ability to heal the wounds of this world. You've lost, lost the ability to preserve life. 
Jesus reminds us that once this happens, you aren't good for the mission that he's called you to, the mission that he's planned for you. So salt both helps the wound and it helps preserve things, but you've got to keep it from getting impure so that it can continue to do its job. Now let's switch gears and let's talk about what does Jesus mean when he says, you are the light of the world. Oftentimes when we talk about this passage, we hear salt and light in this passage. We think, man, these are kind of the same things that Jesus is teaching about. But the reality is salt and light have vastly different functions. Salt is something that does its work without being seen. You, if it gets on a wound, you don't see it necessarily drawing the infection out. You don't see it preserving the food, the meat, the vegetables, those type of things. But it's doing its work kind of in the background. Now, you can put salt on a food to keep it from decaying, but you cannot put salt on food that is already decayed and make it come back to being good to eat or being okay. Salt doesn't work that way. Once it's decayed, once it's destroyed, salt's not going to bring it back. Light, on the other hand, kind of works the opposite type of way. You can see light work. You flip on a switch and the darkness from a room is gone, right? If you've ever been someplace really far away from a city or from a house or anything where there is no light pollution around, and you've ever been out like on a cloudy night where there's no moon and there's no stars, like out in the woods someplace camping, and it gets dark. And I mean dark in the sense that you can't see your hand in front of your face. It is so incredibly dark. Like to the point that you could walk off a cliff and not even know it because you can't see the next step you're taking. And if you've ever experienced that kind of feeling where it is that dark, and then the moment that the sun rises over the horizon and the light just destroys the darkness, it breaks through the darkness. It isn't like it just kind of does it. It takes away the darkness. And Jesus says, listen, you, you as my followers, you are the light of the world. There's an active part of what you do and how you live. Your words, your actions, they pierce the darkness of this world. They break down the darkness in people's hearts. These are things that, that people look at and they say, man, how does that happen? How does light break down the darkness? Because when there is no light, people don't realize what they're missing. Jesus' life was one of action of doing and teaching. Jesus wasn't passive in the way he lived his life. He didn't sit around and say, well, you know, listen, what you believe, that's your own private matter. You do what makes you happy, I'll do what makes me happy. That wasn't who Jesus was. There was an activeness to him trying to change this world that is corrupt and dark. Listen, there are so many references to light in the scripture. Perhaps one of the most famous descriptions of light is when Jesus says, I am the light of the world in John 8, 12. Well, how can that be? How can Jesus be the light of the world and Jesus says we are the light of the world? Which one is true? I love how one commentator talks about this. He says, in in Jesus' day, a traveler could see a city from a long distance away during the day. If you saw a city on a hill and you were a mile or two away, you could see that city sitting on that hill. But at night, people would light the lamps in all of the, in their houses. And as you were walking towards the city from a distance, miles and miles away, you could see the light shining through the windows in the middle of that darkness. And this commentator, he's using this image to remind us the light that people see from us, that light is not our own. But instead, it's the light of Jesus shining through the windows of our lives. I love this image. That my life, the way that I live, and what people see, if there's light in me, it's not my light, it's Jesus' light shining through. So for my friends and my family and people around me to be able to see. Now, over my years in ministry, I've seen the church do so many things to be light to this world. But I think one of my favorite conversations was something that happened several years ago. We were giving out this full Thanksgiving meal a couple days before Thanksgiving. When I say full, I mean turkey, potatoes, stuffing, the size. I mean, probably $100 per family just for Thanksgiving meals. And 
we were taking it to a couple people in the community we knew that could actually benefit from this. And I remember showing up at this house, and I knew that the people in that house were not believers. In fact, they were about as far from believers as you could probably get. But they were people that we knew, we knew pretty well. And so we showed up. And we've got these bags of groceries. And I remember the woman opening the door. We told her what we were doing there, and she instantly starts to bawl. Tears streaming down her face, and all she could say through the tears was, why? Why would you do something like this? And my only response was, because this is what Jesus calls us to do. I'm not judging you on whether you're a believer or not. I'm simply being the hands and feet of Jesus, the light, to show you this is who Jesus really is. White flag, listen, there are time, there's a time and a place for preaching the gospel to people. It is a necessity. It is a priority. But understand this. I have said this before, and I will say it to the day I die. People don't care what you know until they know that you care. You can preach and preach, but if your life, if your life isn't showing the light of Christ to people, it doesn't matter what you say. Most people aren't going to pay attention long enough to even to have any real change. Listen, one pastor I know said it this way. He says, what if your life is the loudest gospel that you will ever, ever preach? Not the words that you say, just the way that you live. What if when it makes no sense at all, you're at the hospital with a family member or a friend of somebody in the middle of the night? What if one day you just volunteer to take your neighbor who's sick to the doctor so that her family or his family can get a break for one day? What if you volunteer to watch somebody's kids so that they can go out and they can enjoy a date night with their spouse? And maybe that thing is what saves their marriage from falling apart. What if instead of eating a meal out with your family, you took that 40 or $50, whatever it cost you for that meal, and you gave it to an organization that helps people like Compassion or, you know, Go Ministries, those type of things. You gave them that money so they could do something important. Because most of us, $40 a month isn't a lot of money. I mean, we spend that going to Taco Bell if you've got a family of four. That's an easy thing to do, Right? But that $40, that $38 a month, let me tell you how much of a difference it makes in that person's life. I told you earlier, I was in Peru several years ago, and when I got there, the pastor of the local project said, hey, I'm really sorry, but there was a mix-up. And the little girl that you and your family sponsor didn't know you were coming. And so they traveled 12 hours inland in Peru to visit her mom's family and to help them. Again, I was a little sad by that. I'm like, listen, this is probably a one-time trip for me. I probably won't see, get another chance to see that sponsored child. But again, that's not why you sponsor a child. So, okay, that's what happens. So a couple days later, I'm at the project and I'm working and I hear somebody say, Pastor Gildahouse. And I'm like, I turn around and I said, yeah. And they said, hey, I want you to meet your sponsored child. This little girl and her family hopped on a bus and took a 12-hour bus ride to come back to Lima to meet the person that was sponsoring them every month. Because to them, that $40 meant everything. It meant food. It meant education. It meant health care. So don't think for a moment that what you do, even the little things, aren't having a giant impact. Unfortunately, a lot of people, they hear stories like this or they think about the things that maybe God is calling them to and they think, I can't do that. I don't have time for that. I'll look weird in front of my friends if I, you know, do some of those things Jesus is calling me to. I don't have the resources. Listen, I've heard excuse after excuse over the years of why people can't do what Jesus is calling them to do. But really what it comes down to is you saying, I don't want to be inconvenienced. I don't want to be inconvenienced. I want to look like the world. I want the brand new boat and everything else that goes with it. And again, I'm not faulting you for having a boat. I'm just saying, listen, if your priorities say that you want all the things the world values, but not the things that Jesus values, your priorities are messed up. Make no mistake, the light of Jesus is in each one of us who have put our trust and our faith in. The question is, are you putting a bowl over that light or 
Are you letting that light shine into the community so they can see what God is doing through you? Are we so concerned with the way that the world looks at us that we look so much like the world around us? Perhaps we're making our lives more about us and not enough about Jesus. Look at what it says in 1 John chapter 1, verses 5-7. through 7. It says, this is the message we have heard from him and declared to you, God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. And if we claim to have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live out the truth. But if we walk in light, as he is in light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, the Son, purifies us from all sin. If your life is not letting Jesus shine through, or when someone watches you and looks at you, what they see back is not who Jesus is. What they see is a reflection of the rest of the world. You are missing out. Look at what Paul says in Romans chapter 2. He says this, You then who teach others, do you not teach yourself? You who preach against stealing, do you steal? You who say that you should not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who abhor idols, do you rob temples? You who boast in the law, do you dishonor God by breaking the law? As it is written, God's name is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. If you're a follower of Jesus, you claim to be a follower of Jesus. If your life isn't reflecting who Jesus is or isn't showing them that light, man, you look like the world and it's ruining your witness to other people. It's no secret that sometimes in life we go through seasons of life that challenge even the best of us, me included. I mean, I've gone through difficult times where I don't feel like it. I don't want to live that kind of life. But I need you to know something. In those most challenging of moments of life, that's when people are watching you the most closely. Will you be salt and light, even in the most difficult situation, or will you compromise and look like the rest of the world? Will you let anger and hurt and disappointment make the salt unsalty? Will bitterness force the light under a bowl? Now, I'm not telling you how you should feel about things. I'm just simply saying that Jesus never called you to be a person who hid that light or wasn't salt to other people. He never said, blessed is the one who feeds into the hurt. Never did he say, blessed is the person who holds it all inside and doesn't show my love to other people. He said, blessed are the meek and blessed are the peacekeepers, peacemakers. I, listen, on this, this morning, all I'm trying to do is get you to understand that the way you live your life, the way that you go about your daily routine should be different than the world. And people should look at you and they should notice a difference. Listen, in Matthew 5, 16, Jesus wraps up this little line. He says, in the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Now, I think we can all agree that this world is broken and decaying. But Jesus is calling you to live a life so that when other people see you, they can see the light of Jesus through you. I want to finish with this, this quick story about this French Christian named Francois Fenelon. This guy was said to live in such communion with God that people looked at him and they couldn't help but notice how much Jesus' light shined through him. Well, there was this skeptic who couldn't believe that any one man's life could be that good. And so this skeptic says, listen, I'm going to go stay with him because there's got to be something behind this. There's got to be something going on here that I don't understand or that he's faking it. So the skeptic, he goes and he stays with Francois for one night. The next morning, he packed up and he left. And this is what he said as he left. If I spend one more night with that man, I will become a Christian in spite of myself. I love that saying. I love that saying. Make your life so much of a reflection of who Jesus is. And the light is shining through you and you're being salt to the world that people look at you and say, listen, if I spend one moment with them, I will become a Christian in spite of myself. That's the kind of life I want to live. That's the kind of life I want to experience. That's the life I want for you to have well, as well. So that when the world looks at you, the windows are so big that people from a distance will look and say, man, 
God's light is coming through that person. Look, they'll look at you and say, man, I want that kind of life. The salt may burn, the salt may hurt, but if it means I can have that kind of life, I'll endure it all. So that's my prayer for you today, that you'll be the salt and the light that Jesus calls you to be. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, we thank you that you are a God that calls us to be salt and light. The truth is, Father, it's not an easy task. It's something that is going to put us at odds with the world all the time. And even as we're at odds with the world, the truth is, God, we know that as your followers, we have been called. We have been called to be different than the world around us. That we could look at people's lives and they could look at ours and they could look at us and say, man, I I want what they have. I don't want to live in this decaying, corrupt world. I don't want to be searching for the things the world says are important anymore. I want what Jesus can provide. God, we thank you. That's the life you call us to. It's in your son's name that we pray. Amen.